today we're talking about a legacy, how to build and carry a legacy. And over the, the last few weeks, we've examined what it takes to build and carry on a legacy. The first week we talked about Christ. It's the foundation of a legacy. The second week we talked about convictions. And we established that we really have one main conviction. It's this, the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible, the Word of God. And all of our other convictions flow out of believing the Bible. Our third thing that we talked about was character. And that was last week. How important character is in building a legacy. Today we're going to take it one step further. And we're going to talk about commitment. Everybody say commitment today. Now there's several meanings of the word commitment. Uh, it can refer to an engagement or other obligations. Uh, it can refer to a pledge or an undertaking that would require time and effort. Or the one that I want to focus on today <clears throat> is defined as being dedicated to a cause, a task, an activity, or a person or persons. Now, in this last meeting that I want to deal with today, in this context, commitment encompasses such qualities as dedication, devotion, loyalty, attentiveness, steadfastness, and faithfulness. It implies a resolute resolve to follow through to make good on promises. Uh, there's a story I came across a few years ago. It's a story about a, a, a pig and a, and a, and a hen, a, a chicken. And the, 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 the hen, she heard about a, a program that the church was having, a local far, little country church there, to feed the poor. And so they were, they were raising money and collecting items from the different farmers to feed the poor. So the little chicken, she had an idea. And she went to the pig and said, I think you and I can help with this. He said, how so? She said, well, uh, we can help feed the poor. I'll donate eggs if you'll donate some bacon. <laughs> and, and the little pig thought about it a little bit. He said, you know, there's just, just one thing wrong with, with your bacon and eggs idea. For you, it requires a contribution. For me, it requires a total commitment. You know, there's some people that they, they want to give what the chicken does instead of what the pig does. They, they want to contribute a little here and there that, that could happen in, any day. But boy, the pig, man, he had to make an all-in commitment for his life. Pat Riley, the great uh, legendary, actually basketball player for the University of Kentucky, and then later on a great coach said this. There are only two options regarding commitment. You're either in or you're out. There's no such thing as life in between. Another individual once wrote, without commitment, you cannot have depth in anything, whether it's in a relationship, a business, or even a hobby. Someone else once wrote, commitment unlocks the doors of imagination. It allows vision and it gives us the right stuff to turn our dreams into reality. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 23, there's an account of what's called David's mighty men. And I love this chapter because it's talking about these men that accomplished so much in battle. First, there was Joshab Bathshebeth. The Bible says that he killed 800 men at one time. Now, you could take on 101, that's one thing, but one on 800? No wonder he was the mightiest of David's mighty men. Then there was Eliezer, who was one of the three mighty men with David when they, when they defied the Philistines who were gathered in battle. He attacked the Philistines, and the Bible says he fought until his hand was so weary that it stuck to the sword. The muscles had contracted. He couldn't open his hand. He had swung that sword so very much, one of his mighty men. But then there was Shama. Everybody say Shama. Now, Shama doesn't sound like a, 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 a threatening name, does it? Shama, kind of sounds like an easygoing guy, but that's not the case with Shama. In 2 Samuel 23, 11 through 12, we read a story about him. It says, next in rank was Shama, son of Agi, from Harar. One time the Philistines gathered at, uh, at Lehi and attacked the Israelites in the field of lentils. Lentils is another word for beans or peas. And the Israelite army fled left Shammah there by himself. But Shammah, it says, held his ground in the middle of the field and he beat back the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Now this was a story about a land grab. You see, peas were one of the main, main uh, uh, foods for the Israelites. And we're not just talking about a garden-sized patch here. We're talking about acres and acres and acres and acres, perhaps hundreds of acres of, of peas there. 
And the Israelite army fled when they saw all the Philistines. But Shama said, you know what? This is my pea patch. Everybody say my pea patch. Nobody's going to take my peas from my pea patch. You know, I think there's some people here today that you need to kind of kind of need to get your shoulders squared away a little bit and get your neck loose a little bit here. And you need to make a decision spiritually that nobody's going to come into your pea patch and take your peas. Nobody's going to come into your marriage and take your marriage. Nobody's going to come take your children. Nobody's going to take your finances. Nobody's going to take the dream that God has for your life. Do I have any shamas here today that will rise up and say, I, nobody's coming in my pea patch and getting my peas. And that's what he did. He defended. He fought off an entire army. One man made a difference. But it wasn't just any man. It was a man who was committed. Everybody say committed. He was committed to what his cause was. You see, the same commitment to a cause is found in our own country. The signers of the Declaration of Independence after enumerating a long list of oppressive acts by the King of England, declared the 13 colonies to be 13 independent states free from British rule. And then in an act of supreme commitment, they concluded this, and they wrote it down. And for the support of the declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Many of the men who signed that declaration did in fact pay with their entire lives. They, like Shama in Scripture that we just read, were men of steadfast commitment. Five of the signers were captured and tortured to death by the British. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in battle and another two sons were captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds and hardships of the Revolutionary War. Many lost their entire families and died bankrupt. A commitment is not something you take casually. It's something that you're ready to invest, defend, and devote your life to. That's why I see sometimes on the news our flag being desecrated or other things of issue regarding patriotism. And, you know, you can have issues with things. We, we all have issues with something. But there are men and women who died and gave their lives, their family, and their heritage so you and I could stand on this part of planet Earth and have freedom today. I don't know of any other country that people are getting on boats and, and facing shark-infested waters to get to. I don't know of any other country people are taking, taking their lives in their own hands and families and trying to get here. Why? Because there's something here that God created special, but it was because people gave their lives and are still giving their lives today. Our military men and women, thank you so much for giving today. Thank you for living today and giving your service today so that we can have freedom today. Here at Cape First, commitment is an important part of the legacy we have received and are passing on to future generations. Were it not for the commitment of previous generations, this church, its ministries, and its influence would not even exist today. You know, as believers and as a church family, there are certain things we consider to be worth committing to, worth defending, fighting for, and, and, and worthy of support with even our lives. We are called by God to be committed, number one, to our relationship with Him. Number two, to our relationship with our family and our friends. And number three, relationship with the family of God. Now we could talk about what it means to be committed all day long, but what does, that, what does it really mean when we say we're committed? You know, I, I'm, I'm a simplistic preacher. I'm very simple and I like things easy to understand. So when I think about commitment, I, I came up with three W's. The first W is way. Everybody say way. This speaks to a plan. Now, the first and foremost important component of a commitment is not on the top 10 list of most people, but it is the top number one key to a commitment, and that key is sacrifice. Would you say that with me? Sacrifice. It's the way, it's the plan. Commitment always requires sacrifice. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? He sacrificed something. Jesus sacrificed heaven to come here to live on planet earth for 33 plus years in a human body with its limitations and to deal with all the things. Jesus went to the cross, to the whipping post, ultimately to the grave so that you and I could have freedom today, spiritual freedom and have a relationship with our heavenly father. 
the disciples sacrificed their positions for Jesus. Someone once said, it's not hard to decide what you want in your life to be about. What's hard is figuring what, what you're willing to give up in order to do the things you really care about. The ultimate test of man's conscience may be his willingness to sacrifice, listen to this, to sacrifice today for future generations whose words of thanks will not be heard. You see, in order to be successful in anything in life, we've got to have a sacrifice in our life. If you want something, you have to sacrifice something to get it. Here's something I learned many years ago. Every time you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else. And every time you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. You can't say yes to everything. You can't do everything. You can't be everything. You, you can't. Uh, you're going to leave this place today. You're going to go to one restaurant, I assume. There may be a few that after I'm finished here, I'm going to this one and eat again. But most people, you're going to pick one restaurant and, and it's the most dreaded words that any, one of the most dreaded words that a man has ever heard. Honey, where are we going to eat today? You pick. You decide. But honey, I'm preferring you. I'm giving you the opportunity to choose. Well, I want you to decide. Okay, let's get off of that right now. <laughs> Most people, most men in here are wearing one pair of pants today. The ones who are wearing pants. The others, uh, the, the, one, the women here are wearing one outfit today. And even though you may have 10 or 20 or 100 outfits in your closet, you picked one today. When you picked one, you had to say no to all the rest of them. When you put your shoes on, you had to say no to all the shoes. You stood there in front of your shoe closet and said, no, no, no. No, I didn't, Pastor. Yes, you did. When you picked that one, you said no. All the rest of the shoes are just like, we're depressed. We're not going today. <laughs> you see, when you say yes to something, you have to say no to something. And so what are you willing to say no to today so that you can have something tomorrow that's in your future that God wants you to have? Commitment is the key to doing that. If you want to have a great marriage, you've got to sacrifice. It's one of the reasons that marriages fail so much today. It's because people are not willing to sacrifice. You say, well, I, I've given my 50%. Well, that's your problem. It requires 100%. Why didn't somebody tell me that before I got married? Well, you should have come to the marriage counseling. We would have told you. No, it's 100%. It's not 50-50. It's 100-100. That's how it works. It's a commitment. I've done marriages before where people, they take out the part for better, for worse. That's not a marriage, that's a fantasy. You have to understand that life is not always wonderful and ooey and gooey in our life. And we have to take sacrifice sometimes to get what we want to have. Sacrifice, and by the way, sacrifice is not always a bad thing. Sometimes sacrifice is getting rid of the stuff you don't really need. See, everything in life has a cost factor. It costs time, energy, money. It also costs giving up one thing to accomplish another thing. Rose, Rose and I uh, have, have had a storage unit for several years. And we, we, we moved a couple of times and so we get this storage unit. We put furniture in it and some tools in it and, and we put memorabilia in it. We had, we had antique beds from my, my, my great-grandparents' antique bed, my, my parents, my grandparents' first bedroom suit in there. And we had all the Barbie dolls of the girls and the Cabbage Patch dolls and all the things like, and, their, and their doll houses and all that stuff was stored in there so we could get it out someday and store it somewhere else. <laughs> And so last year I built this shop and I'm going to move all that stuff to the shop. But for some reason, when the shop got finished, it was full already. So I've been working to get stuff rearranged so I can move stuff out of this storage unit uh, that's 13, 14 feet wide and 44 feet deep and stacked on two levels in there that I built. So to get all of that stuff out of there. So I went out there to get some stuff out this past week. And when I, when I got there, the, the automatic punch code that opened the electric gate didn't work. And so there's a number to call the people. I called him, he says, yeah, the motors burn up on it. Just push the gate open. Well, that's not a good sign. It's supposed to be a secured lot. So I get in, I push the gate open and I drive over there and I walk up to my storage unit with my key to put in my lock and guess what? The lock is not there. Not only is the lock not there, but the hinge that the lock was on was not there because they cut it off. When I opened it up, it was ransacked. All the furniture was gone. 
all of the Barbie dolls were gone. All of the kids' memorabilia was gone. All the stuff was gone. All those antique bedroom suits, all the tools that were in there, all of it was gone. It was strolled everywhere. And it's not like they didn't know who it was because there's plenty of things laying there with my name on it. Even a high school jacket with my name on it was thrown out there. All this stuff. Now on the good side, I don't have to move anything. <laughs> I got plenty of storage room now. Got to look on the bright side. But we paid hundreds or even thousands of dollars over the years to store the stuff that's now all gone. And the storage unit people said, well, we don't have any insurance, so it's okay. There's some stuff in life, you got to give up something to get something else. And sometimes you hold on to stuff so long and it loses its value. What are you holding on to right now that really you're never going to use in your life? What are you holding on to right now, maybe in a relationship that you need to let go? Maybe you're holding on to an event or something in your life. Somebody hurt me. Somebody said something. Let that go. Like the girl saying, let it go. Let it go. Come on. Y'all know the song. If you've got kids, you know the song. Let it go. And all the rest of them. I like, it's summer. I like that one better. Okay. <laughs> Olaf, if you don't know who that is. Okay. What are you willing to sacrifice for a great marriage? What are you willing to sacrifice for a great future? What are you willing to sacrifice for your heavenly father? Luke 6, 38 says, give and you will receive. Make a sacrifice you'll receive. Your gift it will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, and to make room for more. God's going to pour it out in your life, running over, pour it out into your lap. The amount that you give will determine the amount you get back. That's the first one. The first one is sacrifice. It's your plan. It's a way. The way, the way to commitment, number one, is embracing sacrifice in your life. If you're going to have something, you've got to give something to have that. It doesn't just happen. Here's the second W, will. Say that with me, please. Will. Now, this speaks to power. One of Newton's three laws of motion is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now, here's the reaction. Commitment requires power. And commitment releases the power into our lives, whether we call it determination, fortitude, or just a plain old willpower. Without it, our commitment will not stand the test, trial, and difficulties of time. In my opinion, our power comes from two sources. Number one, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all around the world. The other is our will. Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, a very important prayer. He said, not my will. Not my will. Luke twenty two forty two. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. How could that be a real prayer? Because Jesus was in a real human body. He knew what the human body felt. He knew the anxiety. He knew the fear. He knew all of those things. He knew he, he'd already had some pain in his life. He knew what pain was going to be like in that body. He knew he was going to be beaten with the cat of nine tails. He knew he was going to carry a cross. He knew they would drive nails in his hand and his feet. He knew he would breathe his, breathe his last breath in this human body on the cross. And he said, Father, if there's any way we can do this, let's do it. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I believe every Christian has to have a Gethsemane time. And maybe more than one. I've had more than one in my life to where I've come to the place where my will was contrary to what I knew the will of God was and I knew it was better to follow His will than my will and I had to say not my will but thy will be done. Ephesians 6, 14 says, Stand your ground. When you're being made fun of or ridicule for your beliefs, stand your ground. When you don't know what else to do, stand your ground. When everything seems like it's going against you and no help can be found, stand your ground. When somebody's trying to invade your pea patch, stand your ground. Can I say, Americans, when, you're, when, you're, when your freedoms are being violated and attacked, stand your ground. Christians, when your morals are being ridiculed in the news and ridiculed in the movies and ridiculed on the sitcoms and ridiculed in the talk shows, stand your ground. Declare this is my pea patch and you're not driving me off of it. Come on, give somebody, give the Lord praise this morning. Yeah. 
At some point in our lives, we have to make an I will decision. And here's the third W. The first one was the way, the second one was will, the third one is work. That's another one of people's top 10 lists, work. Everybody say work. work. Now this defines our purpose. See, to have a real commitment, we must find meaning and purpose behind the missions we're pursuing. Purpose will produce passion. The reason people live a passionless life, they're not excited about anything, is they don't have any purpose. They've not embraced a purpose in their life. Get up, go to work, come home, mow the yard. Get up, go to work, come home, wash the dishes. Get up, go to work. Okay, that's a, that's a part of the routine, okay? Don't, don't try to define your life by routine because routine is a key point of life. Are you with me here? Routine is a part of accomplishing your goals in life. Without a routine, and I, 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 I can preach a whole message on that. Without routine in our life, we can't get to where we're going. That's part of it. But don't misinterpret that of not having purpose in your life. As a church family, our purpose has already been defined by God. Why? Because His cause is our purpose. And Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's, that's our purpose. That's His cause. Peter wrote it this way in 1 Peter 3, 9, The Lord does not want anyone to be destroyed or perish, but wants everyone to repent. That means everyone needs to repent. Because the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we all need to repent to get God's grace. So how's this supposed to happen? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them, these new disciples, to obey all the commandments I've given you. He told his disciples in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Punch that person next to you right now. Tell him he's talking about you right now. Come on. He's talking about you. He's sending you and I. He gave his followers the same mission that he has. That's our purpose. It's, it's the way of our church family. We're here to continue what Jesus started. Now, in the generations who went before us here at Cape First, if they had not been committed to the purpose, all the thousands of people that have been reached throughout the years, all of the thousands would not have been touched. And you and I wouldn't be here today. Now it's up to us to do the same. May we be the ones, like Shama in our opening text, will be committed to stand our ground, even in the face of fierce opposition. Even when all those around us are failing the test, may our commitment stand no matter what the cost. See, the work we're doing here, the things we're building here, the sacrifices we're making here are not merely for the benefit of those who enjoy them now, but they're for our children and our grandchildren. And then some. Commitment is a key. You know, they used to say when I was in church growing up, they'd say, we're going to do so-and-so and we're going to build this or we're going to do this should the Lord tarry. Well, we don't hear that terminology a lot today, but it simply was a, a phrase that meant there was an expected imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ to take his church out of this world. It's called the rapture. And so preachers would say, well, should Jesus tarry, we're going to do this. In other words, if he doesn't, we're going to heaven and we're not going to do that. I don't know, the, I don't know any dates about Jesus returning, but I can read signs and I'm not too sure that we're closer than we've ever been to that. But should Jesus tarry? I'm hoping that one day, one day in the future, the next generation and the next generation and the next generation will look at color photographs, not black and whites, or digital images projected on the wall, or holographs. Say, oh, who was that guy? Oh, they pastored back in the roaring 20s, <laughs> as in 2020. Who, who are those people? Who are those? Look at those people. We're here today because of them. Hey, there's three quick questions I want to wrap this up with. Number one, will you sacrifice? Will you sacrifice? Will you sacrifice what you believe God wants you to do and the goals He has for your life? Because it doesn't come without sacrifice. It really doesn't. And sometimes it's stuff that you don't want to sacrifice. Do not believe the lie when somebody says, even a preacher well, if you give your life to Jesus, everything will be smooth. It's just like butter. 
hot butter on hot biscuits. No, no, it's not that way. No, it's, that's why Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. And sometimes it'll take some sacrificing. In the first service today, there was a family sitting right over here, just recently started coming to our church. And uh, they have two daughters. And when I was shaking hands, one of the moms said, uh, you won a lot of points with my youngest daughter yet last week. I said, really what? So when you gave that illustration of you going to horseshoeing school to be a farrier back in 1980, and that you were a licensed farrier, and I, and I, and I am. And... Uh, she loves horses. And I told her, I said, you know, I had a pony before I had a tricycle. And I grew up on horses and my wife, we trained horses and everything. What I didn't tell her though, I hadn't been on a horse in 20, 20 or 30 years. I haven't owned one in 30, 35 years. The last time I owned one was when this big tall guy here was a little big baby. And his mama had a couple horses and we had horses. In the, in the church where he pastored. That was it. Do I like horses? Oh, I love them. I'd love to have a horse. I'd, I'd love to have one today. No, don't bring me one. <laughs> I don't care if the Lord told you to bring it. Don't. Because right? I don't have a fence and I don't have a barn and I don't have the time. I don't have the time. I travel too much. The ministry's too much for that. Have a dog and he's on thin ice. <laughs> I'm serious. One of them's already fell through, but I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a joke. All right. I don't have time to get up to go to the bar and feed every day. I don't have time to. I don't have to hire I don't, have, I don't have time. I don't. Why? Because now I can say no to preaching, I can say no to traveling. I could say no to that and have one, but what would I have? A horse. <laughs> and a feed bill and a vet bill. Uh, what would I have? So I'm saying no to that. And I don't need anybody to feel sorry for me. That's my choices. I'm saying no to that because I'm saying yes to this over here. This is my destiny. This is my purpose. This is going to last for eternity. Yeah. When I first went through this, Rose just said under her breath, when I first went through it, oh, I moaned and groaned and whined around and whatnot. Oh, Jesus, like I'm really giving up something for Jesus. <laughs> but when you learn eternal value, here's the key thing. It's, not, it's, it's, it's no problem to sacrifice something when you understand value difference. You see, the reason it's hard for us to sacrifice one thing, this is good. The reason it's hard for us to sacrifice one thing for something else is because we don't understand the value of the something else. When we understand value, you, listen guys, when you understand the value that your wife needs to spend time with you, you can cut back from five days a week fishing to four, okay? You, you can do that when you understand value. When you understand the value of spending time with your kids, you can, you can order, you can order your, your schedule that way. When you understand the value of investing money, you can, you can quit having uh, 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 expenditures over just any and everything and, 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 and buy it's just, oh, you see that, you just want it, and you go buy it. When you understand value, see, that's the key element. When you understand value of sacrifice, it's not, it's not a sacrifice. It's a trade-up. It's a trade-up. I mean, I could be out here riding a horse by myself or I could be changing the lives of people on five continents that I'm preaching on this year. Are you kidding me? I'll trade that any day of the week. And if I want to ride a horse bad enough, I'll go pay somebody to get on their old horse and ride it, but I don't. Because it probably wouldn't be the kind of horse I'd want to ride. I'm picky. <laughs> Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to say, not my will, but thy will be done? Are you willing? Yeah. I quit preaching a while ago. I'm meddling now, okay? <laughs> Are you willing to say, not my will, but thy will be done? Because that's the key. It really is. You have to get to the point to where you say, Father, what you want in my life is what I'm going to do. I don't know how many times in my life I've sat with a couple before who was God was dealing with them about being in the ministry or something else and this blatantly, one or the other blatantly look at me and say, I'm not doing that because I'm not doing this and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. And I knew the, t the clock was ticking on their life. How long their marriage would last, how long, the, how long, the, how long this, all of those things come into play when they're not in agreement 
and the things that they go through, the things their children are going to go through because they're not willing to sacrifice something that really has no value. Excuse me, has little value compared to the great value that God has. Is this resonating with anybody here today? Yes. Are you getting this guys up there in the back? You got this? Is this, is this, this is good? Are you, are you willing to say, not my will, but thy will be done? Amen. Well, I have so many stories in so little time. Are, are you willing? Are you willing to, to work? You're willing to work. To say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to engage. I'm going to engage in it. Now, you may be sitting here and say, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I, I didn't know I was building the legacy. But this applies to every area of your life. Maybe, maybe and, I, and I know this is true, the Holy Spirit's speaking to people right now all over this place. He's talking to you right now while you're having thoughts that you wouldn't be thinking. In fact, you're trying to get rid of them. There's a thought of, um, you, you need to change your diet. Well, I'm going to eat better. 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 When? Holy Spirit's dealing with you right now. Why? Because He wants you to experience life and life more abundantly. Maybe dealing with you about a habit or something in your life. You're trying to kick. You're trying to get over. You're trying to quit. He's dealing with you about that. Will you sacrifice? Will you sacrifice? Will you say, not my will? Will you do something God wants you? You see, when you say that to God, then you can say it to others. That's the reason you can't say it to others. You, you always want your will. If you do, if you always want your will with somebody else, that's because you've never surrendered your will to Jesus. When you surrender your will to Jesus, you, you don't have a problem exerting your will, having to have your way all the time with other people. No, because when you submit it to Him, it changes your life. You know? Maybe... Maybe there's something in your marriage or maybe in the relationship or whatever and you're not willing to buy a book and read it. Like the five love languages. That's a great book. And you read it. One guy read it. He said, I read it and I don't speak any of them. It's your, it's your problem, Bubba. <laughs> not willing to, to, to do, do something for it to be better. You see, just wanting something better doesn't make it happen. Just wanting something doesn't bring it to you. That's what babies do. They sit in their high chairs and go, yeah. That's my grandson right now. What is he, 15, 16, 17 months old? He's already got a deep voice. Ah. He doesn't say, I want something. He doesn't have the words yet. His word is, ah! That's his number one word. If, he wants, if, you, if you didn't get the, you sit him in his high chair, you better have the plate right there. Two seconds after sitting there and there's no food in front of him, ah! Serious. He wants you to pick him up, ah! He wants you to go outside, ah! Ah! It's his it's answer for everything. And right now, every time he goes, Rawr, I'm right there to pick him up, do him whatever he wants to do. But there's going to come a time. <laughs> He's going to go, the Rawr, thing. I'm going to back at him. <laughs> get it yourself, boy. You got legs. You can walk and talk. And you can reach the refrigerator. So you go get your own popsicle. <laughs> Not going to do that for him all his life. And many times, this is a second sermon, by the way. Many times... <laughs> Christians, we're like that baby. We just want, we just want, we're used when we first get saved, we, you know, ah, and God comes through and the Holy Spirit runs over and helps and does, ah, but sometimes we got to learn to talk. We got to learn the word and begin to declare the word. And we says, God, do this. I want this, God, get this for me. And the Holy Spirit says, you get it yourself. You got some faith, get your faith in gear and do something. Begin to stand the word and pray the word. I don't want to pray. Pastor Gary, would you pray for me? <laughs> ah! Oh, this conviction falling all over this place right now. I'm telling you, I can feel it. Ooh. <coughs> Commitment is the key to building a legacy in your life. 